Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the latest Insignia Crisis Management webinar. My name is Jonathan Hemus. I am the Managing Director of Insignia. And this afternoon, we'll be talking with you about the golden hour and how to make the most of that golden hour when a crisis breaks. I know a number of you were on uh, last month's webinar when we talked about the importance of a crisis management plan and the factors within a crisis management plan that were required for it to work effectively in practice. Today, we're going to sharpen the focus even more and take a look at that first hour. What are the critical first actions that need to be taken in order to uh, give you a grip over an emerging incident, issue or crisis? We're looking at it through a crisis communication lens, but many of the uh, suggestions, the actions relates more broadly to the entire crisis management team. And I know that as well as a lot of people responsible for crisis communication, we have risk management, business continuity, emergency planning representatives on the call today. So I trust that there will be insights and information that are of value uh, to all of you. Please, as usual, do uh, ask questions during the webinar and if you can do that via the chat box, the question pane uh, on your control panel, we will then deal with those questions right at the end of the webinar, as many of them as we possibly can. Um, given that this webinar is about the golden hour, I will promise you that we will not take longer than an hour to get through this webinar. Uh, and my intention is to uh, cover off this session within 30 to 45 minutes, but you will definitely uh, be off the webinar within, within the hour. So without further ado, let me uh, move through the presentation. So a quote that I use a lot when working with our clients on crisis management, planning, training and exercising, Warren Buffett, as you will all know, a very successful business investor. One of his famous quotes was, it takes 20 years to build a reputation and five minutes to ruin it. If you think about that, you'll do things differently. And that is a quote from many years ago, but it is truer today than it has ever been. The pace of response demanded expected and required during a crisis is now faster than ever before. The value of reputation, the value of trust, the value of relationships, all of that wonderful goodwill and that intangible asset that's been built up over many years, that is a threat. And it is the very first things that you do in response to an incident, which are likely to have the biggest impact in terms of uh, how, you, how you emerge from that situation. And to add some context and some texture to Warren Buffett's quote, let's look at two of the most recent crises uh, from 2017. United Airlines uh, on the left-hand side, the uh, incident which I know you will all be aware of and have followed when uh, the passenger was rather uh, forcibly uh, reaccommodated from the aeroplane, in the words of, of United. And then secondly, BA's challenges uh, with the IT meltdown six weeks or so ago. In both cases, these were incidents in which the response to it was just as damaging as the incident itself. So in both cases, these were serious issues, but at least as much criticism as the essence of the crisis itself was focused on the way that the organisation did or didn't respond to it. And I guess if we think about the United incident in particular, that is the perfect example of a situation which is uh, generated or certainly escalated by social media, 
that story went round the world in minutes. So this message that how you respond to a crisis is critically important and is in fact uh, the key factor in terms of how people view you subsequently, I think has been proven yet again this year. And very sadly, I think that's also uh, a lesson and a message that has been coming through following the Grenfell Tower tragedy. Looking at how we quantify uh, this, this is another uh, great piece of research that a number of you may be aware of or heard me talking about on previous webinars. Oxford Metric are an organisation which has taken a very uh, close look at the financial impact of crises on the value of organisations. They found that in very simple terms, how you respond to a crisis has a direct impact on the value of the organisation in the long term. The red line you can see on this chart, this relates to organisations who respond poorly. And one year after the crisis, the value of those organisations is significantly less than expectations when the crisis happens. The good news is that there are some organisations on the blue line who, because of their response, actually increase the value of the organisation in the year uh, after a crisis. And where this relates directly to what we're talking about today is at the very start of this chart. You can see that in days one, two and three, right at the left hand corner of the uh, bottom axis, organisations which are going to recover arrest the decline in value far more quickly. It never goes as deep as those that uh, end up plunging on the red line. And Oxford Metrica's conclusion was that is about the actions and the communication that occur in the very early stages of a crisis. So what you do and how you respond early on in a crisis has a big long term impact on where the organisation ends up. So let's take a look at what we observe in a flawed crisis response. When we're looking in from the outside and watching crises happening in front of us, what is it that we see? What we see when perhaps it's not going as well as it should be? Well, firstly, we see organisations who are too slow to respond. There's this vacuum, this black hole when the incident has occurred, but the organisation appears not to be saying or doing anything about it. And sometimes that's hours. Occasionally, it's longer than hours that that, that gap occurs. In an interrelated way, you often see subsequent to a slow response, an organisation which appears to be reacting to events, not shaping or influencing the outcome of the situation. So there's a succession of knee-jerk reactions and responses to things going on around us rather than actually shaping it. We also see inappropriate messaging or communication from time to time. Um, the most famous examples being, for example, I want my life back. We heard that during the BP Gulf oil spill. And even in that uh, united response, the phraseology, for example, deplaning of passengers uh, was not the best use of communication or messaging. We also see gaps in the overall communication response. So you hear customers saying, we tried to get through to the call centre, but there was no response from them, or it was constantly engaged. You hear people saying, we looked for information on their website, but there was nothing there. So people seeking out information are not able to get it. One of the other things we see in a flawed crisis response 
is simply a disorganized, confused or contradictory response, sometimes even within the same organization. So we have head office in New York saying one thing and we have the regional headquarters in London saying something different. All of those are some of the uh, examples or evidence that we see of a flawed crisis response. Why do we see that? I mean, after all, we're usually talking about mature, uh, experienced, responsible organisations, often with very good reputations. What is it that makes those characteristics occur? Well, here are some of the um, factors that we've identified that cause those flaws. Firstly, the fear, pressure and uncertainty, which are all characteristics of any major crisis, unsurprisingly impede the ability of the team and the senior management team to operate effectively. Kind of go back to caveman mode, the kind of um, freeze, um, flee, fight mentality because of these factors. Another reason why we see a suboptimal uh, response is that organisations understandably retain their normal ways of working to deal with the crisis. The problem is that a crisis is an abnormal situation and therefore the normal ways of working just don't work under the pressure of a crisis. And that particularly relates to timeliness and the approach to leadership, uh, communication and management, which needs to be much more um, swift, much more focused, in some senses, much more directive than the normal way of working. Another factor is that people leap to action. There's a natural instinct to want to do something when an event is happening around us to just try and put it right. But sometimes that leap to action is without uh, proper thought. Interrelated with that is a reliance on instinct. So people do the things that they believe are right to do, which means that perhaps they do things that are not the most important things first. And perhaps they forget some of the others which are critically important. The fog of war, in other words, lack of information, uh, confusion and complexity means that we're not able to communicate a clear message. And at a more fundamental level, when we're in the heat of a crisis, sometimes we find out that the very expertise, the people, the tools and resources we need are not there. Some or all of these factors are causes of the kind of suboptimal response that we were just looking at on the previous slide. And what we know these days is that bad news spreads very fast. This is a piece of research uh, conducted by the law firm Freshfields Brookhouse Derringer. And what they found is that 28% of crises spread internationally within an hour and 69% of them spread internationally within 24 hours. Unfortunately, it was taking an average of 21 hours for the organisations at the heart of those crises to respond to them. So you can see that if that is the speed at which you are able to respond, it is significantly slower than what you need to be uh, doing if you actually want to exert influence over the situation. So what we're going to go through over the next uh, 20 minutes or so is a checklist for the golden hour. Now, when I first started in uh, crisis management many moons ago, everyone talked about the first 24 hours being crucial, and they still are. But I do think getting off to a flying start in this first hour is a prerequisite if you want to be certain that you're going to protect your organisation 
and your reputation. So I'm going to walk you through some of the key tasks that need to be completed within that uh, time frame. Uh, we'll look at each of these uh, sections of the hour. And just to reassure you that uh, this slide in particular will be available as a download from our uh, website either this afternoon or tomorrow for you to uh, print off. What I also want to say is this is our best practice uh, template, but delivered in generic terms. Clearly, there may be specific factors within your own organization, which mean additional actions need to be uh, added in or possibly that some of the ordering and some of the priorities might be slightly different. But our view is if you can complete the tasks outlined in this golden hour, then you'll be very much on the right road towards protecting your reputation. So I want you to imagine just for a moment that you are um, head of communications for a retailer called Hanson Brown. And at five past 10 this morning, a tweet came to your attention. What's going on at hashtag Hanson and Brown Oxford Street? Fire alarms going off, people running from the storm, hashtag terrorism, question mark. This is the way that many crises are being brought to the attention of organizations these days. No longer are crises always um, beginning internally and then the outside world finding out. Quite the reverse, because of um, camera phones and social media, often it's the outside world that brings news of the crisis to you, not the other way around. So put yourself in the shoes of this director at Hanson and Brown. They've just become aware of uh, this tweet. What is it that they're going to do over the next 60 minutes to put themselves in a good position to protect the reputation of the organization? OK, so let's talk about the first 15 minutes. Three things I would suggest that critically need to be achieved within the first 15 minutes. One, establish a communication channel with your crisis management team and or the team on the ground. Confirm known facts and confirm information needs. So let's go back to the first uh, item on the checklist. Establish a communication channel with your crisis management team. So organizations uh, organize their, the way that they manage crises in slightly different ways. Some of our clients have communications integrated within the crisis management team and there is a single uh, team. Others, there is a crisis communication team working with the crisis management team. Whichever way it works within your organization, it is crucially important that those that are making the operational decisions and those that are communicating about them know exactly what is going on, are integrated and are, in the cliche, singing from the same hymn sheet. In addition, clearly, it's critically important to establish communication with the front line to actually uh, establish what is going on uh, at the heart of the crisis from someone who is directly involved. So getting those communication channels established quickly enables you to secondly confirm known facts and also confirm what you don't know but would like to know. So just on those last two points, clearly, we need information and we need facts in order to communicate effectively and accurately. A word of warning, it's very easy to want every last piece of information before we say anything. And the danger is that that stops you from communicating uh, for long periods of time. And this is when we start to see that vacuum occurring, whereby the organization is absent 
from the discussion. So, to be clear, I'd never advocate communicating anything of which you are not certain. But that said, you do need to be prepared to communicate what you do know, what you're doing, and how you feel about it very quickly, very early on, or else risk not having uh, a voice in the discussion. So, confirm facts, confirm what you need to know, but don't let that stop you from communicating. Minutes 15 to 30. This is about marshalling your resources and getting yourself ready to mount your crisis response. So, notify your crisis communication or crisis management team of the time of a teleconference or meeting at which the team is going to get together. Initiate social and media monitoring. Set up your process for logging inquiries. Alert your agencies and other key partners. Brief your organization's frontline. Secure administrative support. Start your decision or action log and begin communicating on social media. Let me pick up on a number uh, of these actions in the uh, 15 to 30 minute time frame. Notify your crisis communication team of the time of the teleconference or meeting. Some things for you to be considering as you think about your own organizations. Do you have the contact details for all of the people that would need to be on your team? Do you have the out of hours contact details for the people who would need to be on your team? Do you already know the number and the pin for the teleconference line that you would be using? Have you decided where you would meet? Can you get to that meeting place out of hours? Is there an alternative to your meeting place if the place that you would normally go to is inside a police cordon? Second point, initiate social and media monitoring. Do you have a mechanism for doing that? Do you know how to activate it? Have you considered how you would build on your normal social and media monitoring in the event of a crisis? Moving on to alerting agencies and other key partners. Have you identified all of the organisations and people whose support you might need in the event of a crisis? You will know that crises are very resource hungry and you will need a hundred times more resource on the day of your crisis, if not more, compared with a normal day at the office. So who are those people that will support you in your hour of need? And again, have you briefed them? Do you have their contact details? Are they available to you outside of office hours? Frontliners, have you identified within your organisation who is on the front line? And have you thought about how you would get messages to them in the event of a crisis happening? These are often the people who will be receiving incoming calls or visits from customers, clients, the media, other interested parties. They are the gatekeepers to the organisation. And it's all very well having your goal team, the senior management team, uh, activated but if your front line isn't well briefed as well, then you still have a major problem. Administrative support. Do not underestimate how much administrative and technical support you will require. Identify them beforehand, train them beforehand. And I just wanted to pick up on the final uh, item on the checklist on this slide. Begin communicating on social media. This again requires some thought and some planning beforehand. Is the organisation culturally and temperamentally uh, prepared to start communicating without full information? 
It will undoubtedly help you to have a say in the discussion. It is likely to be beneficial to, pre to protecting your reputation. But have you thought through the resource required to do that, the approval procedures required to do that? Again, considering that this may happen out of hours or maybe in a different time zone from that of your parent company. So how easy would that be to do in practice? OK, moving on to slightly longer time frame, 15 to 45 minutes. Now, note that this uh, block of actions is concurrent with the previous one. What this therefore is saying is you cannot do everything as a single team or by committee. Um, this needs to be, yes, a team effort, but responsibility needs to be delegated and you need to apply a divide and conquer uh, approach. So, for example, whilst you are having that first uh, discussion, probably via a teleconference, somebody else needs to be setting up your crisis communication or crisis management team room. Somebody needs to be drafting the initial holding statement. We'll come to it later on, but that first holding statement certainly needs to be available um, by the end of the first hour, quicker if possible. Somebody needs to be drafting the internal briefing, the messages you're going to communicate uh, to your people. And I think critically in those early stages, uh, communication teams for other divisions, brands and or countries need to be briefed because uh, if you've got a problem in country X, you will find the media uh, approaching your peers in country Y. And so they need to know that something is going on. Um, so whilst that first meeting is taking place, other people need to be looking at these actions. If I can just uh, remind you, please do let me know if you have any questions. Please uh, post those via the uh, chat box on your control panel, uh, and we will endeavour to deal with those questions at the end of this session. OK, so work is now well underway. Let's uh, look at minutes 30 to 60. So again, a bit of overlap with the previous slide. Um, this is the time period during which you will hold that initial crisis communication uh, team meeting. You'll share information, known information, confirmed information with team members. Confirm the roles and responsibilities uh, of the people on that team. Agree the initial communication strategy and objectives, the key messages. Identify and prioritise your stakeholders. Develop the initial stakeholder communication plan. Log first actions and assign responsibility for implementing them. And agree the time for the next meeting. Again, let me pick up on a, a two or three of those uh, actions specifically. The first one is confirming team roles and responsibilities. You'll remember uh, at the beginning of this webinar, I talked about the confusion sometimes that exists within teams because of the uh, fog of war. One of the areas which needs not to be confusing are the roles and responsibilities that you want to assign to people. It's very important in these early stages that people are briefed very clearly on what they as an individual will be required to do. So don't finish that first meeting without everybody being very clear on what their role and responsibility is and just linking in with that, the penultimate action uh, on this slide, don't leave the meeting without being absolutely certain that everybody is crystal clear what actions have been assigned to them and what their deadline is for completion of those actions. Coming back to the fourth uh, action, confirm initial communication strategy and objectives. 
all too often teams get into this syndrome of leaping to action and doing things without having confirmed what the objectives are and what the overall strategy is. We are dealing with precious uh, minutes here, but that doesn't mean that we should throw all of the normal business disciplines away and therefore having uh, objectives for what it is that we're seeking to achieve and the overall strategy is so important at the beginning of a crisis. Fail to do that and what you can see is people within the team assuming, interpreting, inferring what the objectives or strategy is and the chances are that they will all infer or interpret something slightly different and so we have a team that is not as focused and as directed as it ideally would be. Identify and prioritise stakeholders. Again, just a note to make sure that you have a checklist of your um, key stakeholders ahead of time. Don't wait till the crisis itself to brainstorm stakeholder categories or indeed to find out the email address or phone number of your regulator, for example. And the final point on this chart that I just wanted um, to pick up on is agreeing the time for the next meeting. It's important in this first hour to begin to establish the rhythm by which you will manage this situation. So this is your first meeting. At the end of this meeting, many of your team members will go away and implement the actions that, that have been agreed. You then need the team to come back together again in an hour, 30 minutes, two hours, whatever the appropriate time frame is, review where we are, agree what we do next, and then go away and do the next round of actions. So it is important that people um, have the time to complete the actions they've been assigned. It is also important that the team comes back together again to retain the alignment that we should have achieved within this um, first, uh, first hour. So, by the end of the 60 minutes, from particularly from a communication point of view, um, here are some of the critical outcomes that you should have achieved. You should have uploaded material to your website or at least be in a position to be able to upload material to your website. You should have um, issued an internal briefing. You should have issued your initial holding statement. Again, assuming you have judged that it is the right thing to do to proactively do so. You should be in a position to respond to priority posts on social media. And critically, if we're thinking about the crisis communication team, you should, after an hour, be reporting back to the crisis management team on stakeholder interest and concerns. Again, a couple of observations on uh, the points on this, on this chart. Um, uploading material to your website. Consider how you will use your website before the crisis occurs. Your website will be the first place that people turn to for information about your organization's involvement in this situation and what it is doing about it. So you must consider beforehand what is going to be your plan for deploying your website in the event of an incident. Are you going to um, move to a completely new website, a dark site? Are you going to have a section uh, on your homepage that maybe you click onto uh, a link which takes you through to a new page where all the information about the um, about the incidents will reside. And what are you going to do about maybe some of the current jolly promotional positive CSR type material that's on your homepage uh, on a normal day? And technically beforehand, how do you do that? Who does that? What about if the person that normally does it is overseas? Uh, or on holiday or ill when the crisis happens. Think through your website strategy beforehand. 
Respond to priority posts on social media. Do you have a policy for whether or not you interact with um, posts on social media? Is that policy going to apply during a crisis or are you going to change it during a crisis? What's the approval procedure for social media content? How quickly could you get additional uh, staff members assigned to social media, which is going to be um, a key area where your situation is being discussed? And then just picking up on the reporting back to the CMT, it is important in a crisis that your communication is not just a way of pumping information out, but is also a source of insight and advice to play into the crisis management team. So it's totally understandable that the core crisis management team may be blinkered, very focused on what they are doing to respond to the crisis. A really valuable role that the communication team can play is by holding a mirror up to the crisis management team and explaining and representing how the outside world is seeing this crisis and where the centre of gravity is. Um, so there is a real uh, value that the communication team can play beyond the dissemination of uh, information externally. So there is the overall 60-minute um, template. Uh, as I say, this slide in particular will be available for um, download subsequent uh, to this session. Before um, closing for questions, I just wanted to run through the so what. If the, this is the checklist, what are the implications for your crisis management planning, training and exercising? I've talked about some of them, but I wanted to summarise and perhaps add to that. So clearly what a well-conceived, well-executed um, first hour response requires is a well-conceived crisis management plan. And if we think about that first hour specifically, how can the crisis management plan assist? It needs to provide guidance on who manages what. In a crisis, who is responsible for what? Do not be having that debate or that discussion when the crisis occurs. The plan and team activation process. In other words, how do we get the team together? What are the triggers? How does that occur? Know that beforehand. Don't be um, scrambling around working out how to get hold of people um, under the uh, pressure of an intense incident or crisis. Team meeting agenda. You've kind of um, seen reference to that on the previous slides, but what are the key topics that need to be uh, covered in that first meeting. What are the priorities to avoid the syndrome we talked about earlier, where people make judgments on what the most important things are? No, decide beforehand what are the priority areas that need to be discussed and agreed during a crisis. Your first hour action checklist, you've seen that uh, within this presentation, but also, role specific action checklists. If I'm responsible for social media, what are the 10 things that I need to be doing uh, or my department needs to be doing in the event of a crisis? And crucially, and this won't be the first time that you've heard this, contact details. You must have regularly, constantly updated contact details for the team, for your colleagues, for your stakeholders, and crucially, all of those people that will help you to ensure that your reputation and your organisation is protected. If we think about communication specifically, you cannot get or you will be hard pressed to get a holding statement out within an hour if you haven't prepared templates beforehand or agreed a structure 
for a holding statement. So we would suggest having template communication materials, statements, internal briefings and tweets against your key risks pre-prepared. You can see how tight and how pressurized that first hour is. And so anything that buys you 5, 10, 15 minutes uh, of speed uh, is going to be incredibly valuable to you. Agree beforehand the key principles for communication, possibly one of the most important being the approval process. The approval process in a crisis is very likely to be different to the approval process on a day to day basis. So sit down and agree beforehand who needs to approve statements, internal briefings, tweets and other communication materials and make sure that that can happen uh, in a timely manner. Get the forms and checklists uh, pre prepared beforehand and then some real simple fundamental how to guides. For example, how to upload material to a website how to run a press conference. These are things that there may be people within your team that understand how to do that. But what about, again, if that person isn't available in that particular way? You need the kind of guidelines that an intelligent uh, outsider could follow and actually successfully achieve the task. So um, it also helps because, again, pressure makes the uh, brain do funny things and having uh, those checklists and guidelines in black and white nice and simply uh, helps people to um, complete tasks when under when under pressure of both time and the situation itself. Okay so we've got up to another 15 minutes left so any uh, last questions um, please send them through and we'll try and deal with as many of those as possible. Um, the other thing that will uh, ensure that you uh, deploy a successful response in the first 60 minutes of a crisis is having your crisis management response embedded within your organization, not just written down in your manual. What do I mean by that? Well, scenario planning is really powerful. I've described uh, a checklist which I said at the start of the webinar we believe is best practice but by definition because of the broad audience on this webinar is generic. I would recommend that you sit down within your own organization and scenario plan the first hour of some of your biggest risks and I would expect that many of the actions we've described in this webinar would map across into your crisis management response but there will be differences and you don't want to be finding out those differences uh, when the crisis is raging all around you much better to have gone through the scenario planning process and um, think it through identify flaws gaps or additional requirements and plug those gaps uh, ahead of a crisis occurring briefing it's obvious but earlier on we talked about um, getting a uh, message out to the front line, for example. Make sure that your receptionists, switchboard operators, security guards know ahead of time that they may well have a role to play in the event of an incident. Again, don't leave it to the day it happens for them to be given their first briefing uh, or training on what their, what their role would be. Training, again, if this is going to be a slick response, people need to have the knowledge and skills uh, for that to happen. So if somebody has a critical role within your crisis management response, make sure that they receive the training they require. Rehearsal. We've said it before, but I will say it again. Rehearsal is crucial to implementing a successful response. I was at a conference a couple of months back where the organization in question had had a monumental crisis and the guy there said you know we had always run rehearsals and exercises um, but we perhaps hadn't taken them quite as seriously as we should have done 
never again will anyone ever question the value or importance of a rehearsal. Um, and so again, I would just urge you not to learn that hard lesson by having a crisis, um, engage in rehearsals, make sure that you practice your response and learn from those rehearsals and learn from real situations. Um, it's hard to see a silver lining in a real crisis, but it does give you the opportunity um, in the real world to rehearse your response. And it's important that you learn the lessons from that so that if there is a future incident, um, that you handle that even better than the first incident. So that um, concludes the formal presentation. There is time for uh, a few questions uh, and we do have two or three. So if, uh, if though you still have um, a burning question you'd like to put, please uh, drop it through now and we'll try and cover it off. The first one is, uh, what role should legal play in this? Um, it's a good question and it's an important one. So I guess um, when we're thinking about communication, probably one of the critical roles that legal play will be within that uh, approval process. Again, my best advice would be don't wait for the crisis to uh, engage with your legal team. They should be a critical part of your crisis management planning and rehearsal and that discussion between your general counsel and your head of communications as to the principles and process that will apply to approval in a crisis um, needs to be um, ironed out ahead of time. And again, scenario planning can be a good way of doing that. Walking through a situation and testing out the legal input and that interface um, between legal and communications uh, people. Um, one of my most memorable uh, exercises was a couple of years ago whereby we were initially engaged by the communications team of a uh, large organisation and they were particularly concerned about the impact of social media uh, on crisis and on their reputation and how they would deal with the tsunami of social media in the event of a crisis. And they were um, quite a traditional organisation and they were concerned that their legal team uh, maybe didn't recognise uh, how social media had changed everything. So we actually ran a social media exercise for 100 of their uh, legal representatives from around the world where they actually uh, participated in a scenario as it played out via social media. And it was a real um, wake up call for them that gave that powerful recognition that, yes, social media has changed things. And we now recognise that the way in which we approve materials and the way in which we work together as a team between the legal professionals and the communication professionals needs to be needs to be very different. Um, next uh, question, what's your what's your view on the extent to which we should interact with people posting on social media? So another social media related question. Um, I would suggest that in an ideal world, um, you should not just be pumping out information via social media, but that selectively you should be interacting with people on social media. But it is selectively. So if people uh, are asking uh, for information, then I think it is appropriate that you respond to that pointing them for example to the place on your website where you should where they can find that information i think it will also be partly driven by um the way in which you operate on social media on a day-to-day -day basis so if you're actually um the kind of organization that is uh communicating with with consumers uh, on a day-to-day -day basis on social media you certainly should be interacting because it would appear very strange if you suddenly became this very uh, corporate organisation when on a day-to-day -day basis you've um, interacted in a more informal way um, during the good times. Um, equally, 
if you're normally not that kind of organization, you may have more of a case for not being as informal and as interactive uh, as the more consumer facing organization. What I would say, though, is the way in which you communicate on social media will communicate a tone of voice. It will um, create a perception in the minds of your stakeholders as to the way in which you are dealing with this crisis. So if you are quick and empathetic and clear in your response on social media, that will, and personal, personal is important, that will create all of the right impressions. So equally, if you're not present or if you're very formal or if you're not prepared to engage, that will also uh, communicate a certain impression, possibly not the one that you want to communicate. Uh, next question. Where a crisis emerges after a slow burn ongoing incident, are there any principles that can be added to business continuity planning, which help a smoother transition from incident to crisis? I guess um, my overall response to that would be to identify generically within your business continuity and crisis management planning triggers or criteria which determine when a situation has reached a point which becomes a crisis. So what are the characteristics, what are the criteria that define a crisis compared with an incident or issue? And I think you can do that in a generic way in your planning. I think the other a uh, really valuable thing that you can do which relates to this question is within the situation itself, one of the traits that we see uh, all too frequently is the creeping crisis where it just incrementally gets worse and worse and worse. And from a situation at the beginning of the crisis where it very clearly isn't a crisis, because it only gets worse incrementally, we never notice as an organization that actually a threshold has been passed and we are now in crisis mode. And so a way of avoiding that is early on in the situation, set some thresholds and some criteria that say, if this happens or if that happens, or if we have this many complaints, inquiries, this level of interest, whatever the criteria are, you set them at the start of the incident or issue, not try to constantly evaluate as the situation is just getting worse and worse. So it's about saying, if this happens, then we know that we've reached another level. So I think we have covered off all of the uh, questions. What I also wanted to do before finishing uh, this session is to say we are not planning a webinar in September. Uh, we're going to uh, not schedule any webinars for uh, the rest of July or August because of the holiday season, but we are going to resume uh, our uh, programme of meetings with a live exercise, a face-to-face -face event on the 12th of September at the Churchill War Rooms in London. It will be focused on uh, cybercrime because we know that that is uh, an ins uh, an issue which is facing many organizations. It's a, a free event. It will be um, open to all of our clients and contacts. There are limited numbers. Um, invitations will be coming out shortly, but uh, please put the date in your diaries if you would like to uh, move from the virtual environment of the webinar to uh, a face-to-face -face exercise. Uh, and if you'd like to uh, drop me a line expressing your interest even ahead of the uh, invitations, please do so. Um, so that's the 12th of September cyber exercise on the morning uh, in the Churchill War Rooms. And as I say, do drop me a line via uh, any of these means uh, if you've got any questions about the webinar or indeed if you'd like to uh, request uh, pre-invitation, uh, a seat 
at the War Rooms uh, event. So, as always, thank you very much for joining us for this session. I trust that you found it interesting and useful. Uh, a recording will be available uh, as a download from our website within the next 24 hours, as will be a copy of the graphic around the golden hour. Um, expect to receive uh, links to those in the next 24 hours, and as I mentioned, an invitation to the War Rooms event uh, later this month. Thank you again. Do please contact me if there's anything we can help with, and uh, I look forward to talking with you again soon. Many thanks.